Father, we thank you once more for all of your love and your mercies, for everything you're doing to save as many as will listen. Help us to be part of the few. We pray now that you will guide us. We're moving into territory that's not familiar to anyone. Help us to understand, first of all. And having understanding, may we move forward to know what our responsibility is. Bless us now as we open our minds and our hearts. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear. Amen. In Desire of Ages, page 490, it says, Hence forward, Christ followers were to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. That's it. Satan is a conquered foe. That's the end of that. Now, if we really understood that, and we really believed it, and we really lived that way, then say it would not be a problem for us at all. But there still is a problem. And that's what we have to face up to. And people who want to go to heaven because they think they have faith, the right kind that will get you there, are really going to be sadly disappointed because there's a lot more to this than just what you believe. Well, she continues here. It says, Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them. Well, did he do it or didn't he? Did he gain the victory for me? Well, what am I fussing about then? Why well, am I always wondering if I'm ever going to get the victory? You know what the problem is? I want to do it. I want to save myself. Isn't that amazing? A Seventh-day Adventist can be so silly as to think he can save himself. It says... Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them. That victory he desired them to accept as their own. Behold, he said, I give unto you power. Now that's what we've been talking about for years here. What is that power? And we finally got over to John 17, 3, because it says it in there, what the power is. And so we've been talking about, for years, about John 17, 3. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. How much is that? See? That's been in the Bible the whole time. That is what Christianity is all about. He, Jesus says over there in Luke, I give you power because I have given you the victory. I got it. Now it's yours. So I give you the power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. The omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit. What's that? Who's the Holy Spirit? The omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit is the defense of every contrite soul. Not one that in penitence and faith has claimed his protection. Will Christ permit to pass under the enemy's power? Not one. It's never happened. Ever. And it's never going to happen. 
The Savior is by the side of his tempted and tried ones. Who? There's not a Trinitarian in the world that believes that statement. Trinitarians don't know these things. And they can't believe in them because their religion says it's not so. But the Bible religion says it's Jesus who's there with you. With him, there can be no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility, or defeat. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. And that's exactly the way the, the Greek says that. We went through that before a little bit here. That is not the way it reads in the King James, but that's okay. In their way of thinking, that's what they were saying. But we read it from the Greek here not long ago, and she says it exactly the way the Greek says it. And she was not a Greek scholar. She wasn't any kind of a scholar, and I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> She had common sense, and she had a source for truth. Jesus himself. You don't need to be a scholar if you know Jesus. Well, I think that's all I'm going to read from that. Uh, is that enough? Does that say anything we need to know? Do we need to get into those statements? Do we need to know that's me? I believe every word of that. That's the way I live. That's my hope. You know the spirit of prophecy is full of information like this. But we just read it through to get the stories. It's not about stories. It's about my life. Do I live in that, that place right there? Do I believe it? Am I one of those? And I have to say it again, there's only going to be few who ever get this. Everybody's got this book. Everybody. It sits on the shelf over there someplace. Who knows when it gets taken down, but it's on the shelf. Ellen White said, Desire of Ages should be in every home. Well, even if we got it there, who's going to read it? So, Satan is a conquered foe. The power. The power. Romans 1.6 No. That can't be right. Romans 1.16 Maybe I ought to put on my glasses. I'll see what's happening here. 116. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul's going to tell us what the, what the gospel is. Is the gospel about faith? Is the gospel about... What is the gospel about... I've never read that the gospel is, is about faith only. It's not there. Let's see what Paul has to say. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it's the power of God. Unto salvation to everyone that believes. To everyone that believes. It's not for unbelievers. Unbelievers get nothing. They go to church for a thousand years and they're still going to get nothing. It's for those who believe when God says something. It's the truth. And it works every time. <laughs> so that gospel is the power of God. Unto salvation that everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we're still talking about the power because 
Once we looked at John 17, 3, we saw something very important. There's a father and there's a son. Yes, there's God and there's the one that was sent. That's all very important. But what did he send him to do? For some reason, people are not getting over there. He sent him to give us the power. The power. And, and Paul just told us it's the power unto salvation. What is salvation? Does it mean I don't have to go into the fire now? Is that salvation? That's not salvation. That's what the Sunday churches teach. Salvation is from sin. There's no other salvation in the Bible. It's from sin. And if I don't get over there, I miss the whole point. <laughs> from sin. And by the way, that means in this life. It doesn't mean later after Jesus comes. Because I've talked to lots of magicians who think that's when it happens. is when he comes. No, it's in this life. And if we don't get salvation from sin, what we get is darkness. And you don't have to work to get darkness. <laughs> it's just, it just happens. Darkness happens. And what is darkness? It's the absence of light. So the only way we're going to get over to salvation is to get the light. That dispels the darkness. And do you know what? There are people who love the darkness. They would rather do anything else in this world other than give up their darkness. They have to have their darkness. They love it. And they hate the light. Because you, if you love the dark, you don't want anything to do with the light. Because what does the light do? It shows you <laughs> who you are. <laughs> So light is bad news to people who love their darkness. They love their sins. Give up sin. What are you talking about? I love my sins. Oh. Why do you think people do their sins? They love them. You mean I love my sins? Yes, you love your sins. Well, that's kind of rough. Yes, it is. We're going to have to start waking up here and find out what's going on. How come Christianity doesn't appear to be working someplace? We want it to work right here. We have to become part of the few. And only the few understand the things we're talking about here. Revelation 14, verse 6. We all know that one. Uh, come on, Bible. Revelation 14, verse 6. You know, that's our chapter. That's the la God's last people on this earth, that's their chapter, Revelation 14. The whole Bible is theirs, but that's the place. 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel this angel has the everlasting gospel and of course that doesn't surprise us reading in the Bible we say well yeah we know angels have the everlasting gospel well this is not talking about an angel this angel is a symbol there are three of these angels <laughs> and all three of them are the same symbol. These angels are the holy ones. Yes, the holy ones. The righteous ones. These people have the everlasting gospel. They don't just preach it. They just don't teach it. They have it. It's in them. And you know, you can't give away something you don't have. 
These are the true Seventh Day Adventist people. These angels. They have the power. These are the few. Right here. Did you ever think about Revelation 14? That's just the few. Well, yeah, you know the word remnant. Remnant doesn't sound like a whole bunch of anything, does it? These are the few. They're righteous. They're holy. And they're on the move. They just don't walk around on the earth. They're flying through heaven. <laughs> These have the power. Let's see how it works. Sin, confess. Sin, confess. Sin, confess. Sin, confess. Does that sound like the power? Doesn't sound like the power at all, does it? Do you know what it sounds like to me? These people have no repentance. None. You mean sin confess means you're really not repenting? Well, let's put it this way. What are we re confessing? Is it the same things all the time? Is it exactly the same sins over and over and over and over again? Well, if it is, where's the repentance? Do you see how this works? Step to Christ 23, it says, Repentance is sorrow for sin and forsaking them. So if we are repentant, we will confess, but then we give it up. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to have something else to confess someday, but it means that sin that we're so sorry about, we tell God, please forgive me. I forsake that. Now that I see it, I understand it. I'm not going to do that anymore by your grace. That's the power. See? That's the power when we do the whole thing, not little pieces. So why are we doing this? Because last time we talked about the real gospel of salvation, and it includes faith, hope, and love. See? That's the real thing. And if you just have faith, you don't have salvation. Oh, this frustrated me so much 40 years ago when all I ever heard people say was righteousness by faith. Yeah, it's 40 years ago. But then I began to read the Bible and the spirit process. I saw it's not in there. It's faith. Hope. Love. Now there's somebody who has faith only. And James tells us about him. And all the people that work with him, they're not called people in the Bible, they're called demons. They're devils. Yeah, there's a head devil. And he's got lots of devils with him fallen angels. But it says in James that if you believe, you do well because even the devils believe and tremble. So the devil has faith. What's it doing for him? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. He's going to die eternally. And he believes. And I have to say, he believes more than 99.9% .9 of the Seventh-day Adventists in this world. He really believes. He knows. 
He saw the Father in heaven and he heard him declare, this is my son. He knows. He doesn't have to have faith in that. He knows. So he has faith, but he has faith alone. How do I know that? Because he doesn't have hope. He has absolutely no hope. He knows he's dead. Jesus said it is finished and that's it. Nobody can change those three words. The devil is finished. <laughs> so the devil has faith, but he doesn't have hope. And I, I know he doesn't have love. You have to have all three or there's no salvation. So the real salvation of God is never faith alone. The salvation into eternity is faith, hope, and love. Paul says it in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, these, these three abide. That means forever. These three abide. Let's see how Jesus said it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Now we have not yet really begun to read all the things Jesus has to say about our subject. We're trying to understand this just from the things we already know without going deeply into all the different ways he said this. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord. Oh, they call him Lord. They go to church. They call him Lord. They've been baptized. Not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, there's the Father and Son doctrine, but he added something more than the Father and Son doctrine. He said, he that doeth the will. There it is. That's Jesus talking. Anybody want to argue with him? <laughs> Anybody want to change it? Anybody say, well, I'll do it a different way? No, he that do it, the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? Oh, these people even think they're prophets. Uh, in thy name we have cast out devils. Oh, we had power over the devil. And in thy name we did many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. What words? Who wants to hear those words? That is have to be the most terrible words in all eternity. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity, you are unrighteous, you're unholy, you're unclean. And these people are all of them churchgoers. They think everything is all right because they have faith. I hope you're beginning to understand. I'm not trying to talk through my hat here. This has meant a great deal to me for a many, many years. How can we as a people be so deceived as to think that faith is the only thing we ever need to talk about? It's not in the Bible. And it's not in the spirit of prophecy. We've got to face the facts. We were all of us taught wrong. Every one of us. We were taught by Trinitarians a false salvation. We were all of us taught by Trinitarians. 
And if you haven't learned it by, until, by now, you can't trust a Trinitarian. Because they don't know very much. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. Awake. Awake to righteousness. So I don't have to say it anymore. Paul says it right here. Awake to righteousness. And sin not. So righteousness doesn't go with sinning. Righteous people don't sin. Confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. The same sin. They repent. And they're sorry, and they say, Lord, forgive me. I didn't understand that issue. Forgive me. I forsake it. You have to give me the grace now to stay there in that place. And we, we are ready to talk about that yet, how this all happens. We're trying to get there, how justification works, what it really is. We're trying to see that the Bible doesn't talk about Faith only. That's what we're trying to see right now. So he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. Now is it in the word knowledge. That's what faith is. Faith is the teaching of truth that you receive and you believe it. That's not the way it's taught in our churches. But that's what the way the Bible says it. So it says here, knowledge. The word is knowledge. They have not the knowledge of God. They don't know. John 17, 3. See? They do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. That's Paul talking. Oh, he says, he says, come on, awake to righteousness. What do you think? You can just keep sinning, confessing, sinning, confessing the rest of your life, and you think you're going to go to heaven? He says, wake up. You don't even know God. Now, I could never say these things to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Because I don't have those kind of gets, okay? But Paul says it, and I can quote him, <laughs> okay? And I know he's right, because Jesus taught him. You know, Paul went to see the other apostles, and he talked to them, and they all got together, and they, at first they looked at him and said, well, this guy has two things against him. He used to go around killing Christians. Oh, we have to be nervous around him a little bit. No, 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 he's a Christian. Okay, we'll get over that. But, but he goes out there and he talks to Gentiles. What's with that? We're supposed to save the Jews. No, he's out there saving Gentiles. But then they realize something. But he says the same thing we say. He teaches righteousness. He teaches giving up sin. He teaches receiving Jesus. He teaches everything Jesus taught us. Yeah, he has to be one of us. And they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They said, yeah, we don't understand some of this. You do. But you're one of us. So do you think a person who is constantly being overcome by sin, is that Christianity? That's not the power. That's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus said. It's not what Ellen White said. Satan has been overcome. In John 8, 34, he's talking to the Pharisees there. They all think they're the church. And Jesus said, He who is overcome by sin is the servant of sin. You know, the word servant in the Bible really means slave. <laughs> okay. 
So a person who is overcome by sin is a slave. Now, Jesus began that sentence by an interesting word. Whosoever. He did not say everybody in the world is like that. He didn't say that. Because there are some people who have learned what it is to be a Christian and are not slaves to sin anymore. So he said, whosoever is still a slave of sin, well, that's a different person than a Christian. Okay? We need to really focus in on this. What is a slave? Where do you get slaves from? They're, they have a master. Yeah. A slave has absolutely no say about anything. They just do whatever they're told by that master. And if they don't do what the master says, they get in real big trouble real quick. So slaves do what they're told. They have no choice. Well now, since Satan has been overcome, what's going on here? According to Jesus, he's not my master anymore. I think we're, we're easing over into Romans 7, a, a most greatly misunderstood chapter. Romans 7. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I hate, that's what I do. And the people all say, Amen. <laughs> Isn't that awful? They say, yeah! <laughs> no, no. That chapter's not talking about Christians. Chapter 8 is about Christians. There's a difference between those two chapters. And when a person says, but I'm Romans 7, we're going to talk about it. We're going to have to get there because that is so misunderstood. There are going to be people lost because they don't know what the Bible is saying. And we're also going to spend the time talking about I die daily because I haven't found anybody yet who knows what Paul is saying. We've got to understand these things. But first we have to understand what is sin. Oh, it's a transgression of the law. That's too quick. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain just told you something you aren't going to get past until you understand what Jesus said. Ellen White says, transgression of the law is the only definition sin there is. Definition, okay? So we say, okay, I got it. I understand it. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's the only definition. But she did not mean that's all there is to know about what sin is. She just said that is the ultimate, that's the thing you see. Sin is a transgression to the law. That's the doing part. But do you suppose there might be something before the doing part? Oh, so it's not the only thing we need to look at. You see, here's the problem. We've got to use our brain and start looking at things and not just taking what it looks like at first, but what could it mean? And where's more information on it? And what did Jesus say? Because he has a lot to say about what sin is. And he didn't say sin is the transgression of the law. That's the only definition there is. And that's all there is to it. No, he never said that. And neither did Ellen White. She knew better. But she tells us sin is the transgression of the law. That means you've gone out of the bounds of law. You're not in there anymore. You're lawless in the Greek. So sin is you're outside the boundaries of law. Well, how did you get there? That's what we need to look at, see? We need to understand what is the root of all of this that we're talking about. Why do we need salvation? And salvation from what? 
what in the world is there? So we have to ask the question, what is behind what we call sin? Let's go back there. Let's, let's go take a look. The slave does what the master says. There's a master here someplace. Yes, there's a master. And we have all been told it's the devil. But the devil has been overcome. Ah, even the people on the stage making their funny say, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. The devil can't force a single human being to do anything. And he certainly can't make a Christian do anything. So what's the real problem here? Hold on to something. The problem is not what you do. It's what you are. That's the problem. So stop looking at your commandment keeping or your sinning. The problem is much deeper than that. That is just what you can see. That's what happens. But what makes it happen is the other side that you never looked at. We must be delivered from the real slave master. And it's not the devil. You know, back there in the olden days, the church had a problem. They didn't do what they knew they should be doing. They had a revelation. And they got themselves in big trouble because God said, you don't want me to bother you? Okay, that's your choice. You don't want me to bother you? I won't bother you. I can't protect you anymore. And what happened? Yeah, you know what happened. The devil was turned loose. He says, I got him now. I knew I'd get him. So the Egyptians got a hold of him. That was, of course, after a new pharaoh came in because the other pharaoh, he was all, all right with him because he knew they had the real God. But he died. And a new pharaoh came in and he didn't like these people at all because they weren't just a few people anymore. They outnumbered the Egyptians. <laughs> and they were rich and they were smart. So he says, I have to do something about this. So little by little, he put him to work, doing his things. So now I want you to get the picture here of these people. This is the church of God. These are the people who professedly serve God and Him only. Commandment number one. But here we see them working. In the hot sun to build up Pharaoh's kingdom. They're building him monuments. They're working for the devil. The church is building up the kingdom of the devil. Do you suppose that it was because the pay was good? Do you suppose there was pleasant work? Why were they doing it? The church of God building up the kingdom of Satan. There was a guy out there with a whip. <laughs> they were slaves. And the 
church of God was doing what they were told because they had a master. No choice. Do you see it? They had no choice. They did what they were told and they were saying, Romans 7, surely they were saying, all oh, the things I hate, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> And the things I want to do, I don't do. Why? Because they were slaves. Where were they going to go to get help for this now? They didn't like the situation. They're slaves. There's a, the master and he's tough. And on top of all that, I have to work out in that hot sun. What could they do? Well, let's go over here to that kingdom over there. Maybe they'll deliver us. Who is this master? That kingdom over there is not going to help out one little bit. I mean, this is Egypt. This is Pharaoh. <laughs> they squash anybody that messes with it. Well, that's no solution. What else can we do? And as they looked around, it didn't matter what they came up for a solution. There is nothing on this earth that could deliver them from being slaves. Nothing. But because they used to serve the real God, but they had departed from him, they remembered. The condition we're in is going to take a miracle. It's going to take a miracle to get me delivered from this horrible master where I can't do what I want to do. I only do the things I hate. They were facing the power of sin. Now I want to ask you another question here. We have learned about the power of God and we know about the power of sin. Those are two very real powers. Power of God, power of sin. Is the power of sin a big deal? Is it really good? Not good, great? Is it big? Yes, the power of sin is something monstrous. What about the power of God? It's invincible. It's, it's uh, infinite. It's boundless. That power. So which power is greater? Well, intellectually in our head, we can say it right now. Well, of course God's power is the greatest. Do I really believe that? Because God tells me Jesus has delivered me from the power of sin. Really? Yes. The devil is a conquered foe. Really? Yes. So how do I get delivered from the power of, of sin? My master. Well, I hate to tell you the bad news. But you, in your own self, are the master of sin in your life. The problem is not Satan. The problem is not Pharaoh. The problem is me inside of me. There's something inside of me as a natural human being that will not let me do what I want to do after I know what's right. And I do the things I don't want to do. Because I am my own master. I am my own God. And there's nothing on this earth that can change that. <laughs> nothing. So what am I supposed to do? You have to do something I have not mentioned yet in all these years. But it's time. <laughs> you have to be passive. Because there's nothing you can do. Yes! You must be passive. You have to give the problem over 
to somebody else. And you all know who that somebody else is. <laughs> That's what he's been trying to tell us all this time. He says, come on, I've already been to the cross. Nothing can change it. I conquered the devil. My victory is your victory. I want to give it to you as a gift. I want to deliver you from the master sin. I want to deliver you from yourself. Give yourself to me so I can do it. And you know that old man in us says, Is that safe? Ooh, what's he going to do if I turn myself over to him? <laughs> yeah, I told you a long time ago about a dentist in San Diego who came to me, an elder, a good man, good, nice man. I mean, he was a decent person. He was an elder in the church. He came to me. We were sitting in the office alone. He says, Pastor, I have to tell you, I don't know what to do about this. He says, I can't surrender to God. <laughs> Elder of the church. Intelligent man. He was a dentist. I said, you can't surrender to God. I said, well, what's the problem? <laughs> he looked at me and with his head down and looking at the floor, he says, I know if I surrender to God, he's going to send me to Africa. And I, I looked at him. <laughs> and I thought in my, in my mind, can he really be so foolish? This man's going to lose eternity because God's going to send him to Africa. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I just know it. <laughs> I just know it. And then I looked at him and said, well, what if he did send you to Africa? What's the big deal? <laughs> if he sent you, he would have you there for a reason. <laughs> the man just said, well, I don't want to go to Africa. I said, okay. But you know, he's no dumber than anybody else because who else is saying, I can't surrender all the way because... There's always a because. I'm going to have to stop doing this, and I like doing this. It's not that bad. It's no big deal. But God's going to take it away from me. Oh, the pages are just flowing in my head right now. Steps to Christ, she says. What is it God wants when he asks you to surrender? And you say, I can't surrender everything. Oh, she says, what is it? You're going to lose your darling sins. <laughs> your darling sins. She says, oh, oh, I'm ashamed to hear it. I'm ashamed to write it. Well, that's it, folks. The master is not Satan. He's the master of lost people, but he's not the master of Christians. He never has been and he never will be unless they give it back to him. And we're going to talk about that later. We're trying to understand justification by faith. There's nothing you can do to be justified before God because you cannot deliver yourself from being the master of sin in your own life. You can't do it. Nobody can do it. So if we're going to be delivered, it's got to be from outside. And that outside is Jesus. He says, I will deliver you. Now when we read that in the Bible, because you've all read it in the Bible. We've all read it. What's my response to the words of Jesus? He says, I will give you a new heart. He knows the problem. We all have a hard heart. 
So he says, I will give you a new soft one. He says, you can't do it, but I will do it. I'm the creator. I will give you a new soft heart. So what's my reaction to all that? Well, that would be nice. I wonder if that really works. Does that ever happen? Let me look around. Let me see. Go to church and look at all the people and see if I can find one. Uh, do you have a soft heart? Do you have one? Have you been delivered from sin? Have you... How far is that going to get us? Ask anybody if they're righteous. You won't find one person in 15 billion that will tell you they're righteous. And if you did, that one is not righteous because righteous people don't say that. Okay? So you can't go around looking for something and expect to see it right in front of you. Do you know that when Jesus walked the streets, nobody looked at him and said, oh, there's the perfect spiritual man. Because he didn't look like one. He looked like them. So nobody's equipped to find a perfect righteous man by looking at him. But Jesus has told us who the perfect righteous man is. It's the one that believes in him. And he says, I will deliver you. I will give you my righteousness as a gift. A gift. Have you ever paid for a gift? I don't know if anybody's ever done that. Have you ever, when somebody gave you a wonderful present, and you know they love you and they give you this beautiful present, have you reached in your pocket and said, well, here, let me pay for that? What, 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 what would that do? What would that say to anybody? Man, this person can't even take a gift. <laughs> They want to pay me. Who do they think I am? <laughs> well, that's what we try to do to Jesus. He says, I have a gift for you. And it's the kind of a gift nobody else can give you. Just me. And I give it to you because I love you and I want to. And I paid a big price to be able to do this. But it's yours. With no money. <laughs> With nothing you can give me back. But if you understand what's going on here and you understand it's coming from my love, maybe it will awaken something in your heart. Maybe your heart will begin to say, you know, I really like this and I really appreciate this person. This is the kind of person I could open up and love. And more than just love, all the way. So you see, we need to be delivered from the master, the one we never thought about, the master sin inside. The only one you know about for sure, you know who that master of sin is. Jesus says, give him to me. I'm going to stand here at the door and knock. Open the door. When you open the door, you're telling me you can have that man of sin. Take him. I don't want to ever see him again. And Jesus says, okay, open the door. Well, we're, we're now starting to understand what the hope is. First comes faith. That's always first. Faith is the knowledge. Faith is is the facts. Faith is the truth. When we find out what all that is, when we find something that we can really believe, then we have faith in that. But then the devil comes and says, oh, oh they're getting too close to the reality here of what God is doing, so I'm going to give them some trials, some trouble, some tribulations. And I'm going to make them wonder if they can ever do these things that God says. I'm going to make them doubt. I'm going to make them look around. But then God says, no, 
with the faith, with the facts, with the understanding, with the knowledge. I will now give you something else. The desire to have what the faith has shown you. And the desire does not come from your mind. You're trying to do this all with your mind. But you can't be saved by your mind. You have to have hope. Because hope comes from your heart. It comes from who you are. It's your soul. When you hope from the inside with all that's in you in the facts, in the faith part, those things together now we'll have something to work with. I will give you love now to work with. And that love and that hope, that desire in the facts, that will bring you salvation. Because you believe that what I have given you now, when you are justified, is the righteousness of Christ, but you don't get it all, you can't see it. But your hope is, it's coming. It will be revealed to everybody, my righteousness. Because Jesus has given me his righteousness, it will finally blossom out. As we walk together and I learn how to be a Christian, the way the Bible says. So for today, the first thing we need to know before we move any further is, there's a master. And we have been paying attention to that master until the time we get justified. And the master is me, my sinful self. I don't want to give up sin. I'm afraid of it. I don't know what would happen if I stopped sinning. Somebody might start laughing at me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrible? I might scare myself. <laughs> That's an all, another comedian said that. Oh, I scared myself. You see, the devil has used all of these things to keep people away from the truth. Now we're talking here about surrender because justification doesn't happen until we know what surrender means. And the surrender is not of my good things or my bad things. It's the surrender of everything that's me. Everything, because everything that's me is the master of sin in my life. And Jesus wants to deliver me from that master. He's paid for it. He's offering it. He says, why don't you ask me what, how this works and I will reveal it to you. So we have begun. We have begun here to really understand what justification by faith is. Justification means I have been made right with God. My master has been taken away from me. And I have a new, a new husband. That's a different story, isn't it? The old husband has to die before I can get a new husband. <laughs> we'll talk about that too. Jesus said all these things for a reason and Paul says them. Because there's only one real justification by faith. And we will know when we have done it. We will know. We will not know when we're actually converted and turned around always. But we will know that we have made the choice. And we have yet to talk about that. This is all happens by a choice. There's nothing automatic. We have to choose and we have to know what we're choosing. But the Lord is drawing us to that, to know if we are actually in that place. We want to know for sure. And then we can help somebody else and get them off of this by faith alone stuff. There's a place for faith alone. A lost person, that's all they can have is faith alone. What we're trying to understand here is there's no such thing as a Christianity without faith. I mean, with faith alone. Excuse me. 
There's no such thing as a Christian with faith alone. So let's end there. Let's let's uh, get ready for uh, our next step. Maybe the next one should be I die daily. I think that will help us understand a couple things. Father, you're bringing us closer. You're helping us to see that what we thought was Christianity before is some kind of a ruse. It's a fake. The devil has convinced the churches to do things that have nothing to do with your word, that have nothing to do with trusting Jesus for everything. Help us to overcome our old ideas. Help us to step onto new ground Help us to hear your voice. We're so thankful that you have promised. Amen.